Welcome to First Chapter Friday at Newport Public Library. It is November, and in honor of Veterans Day, I thought I would try to find something military. Then I remembered The First Conspiracy by Brad Mel Meltzer and Josh Mensch. I am a diehard fiction reader, and I've always wished I could read more nonfiction because I would be so smart if I read as much nonfiction as I do fiction. And then I found Brad Meltzer, and he writes nonfiction books that are like action adventure stories. So if you like that genre, definitely pick up some of his work. This particular piece, The First Conspiracy, this, The Secret Plot to Kill George Washington, I especially enjoyed, and I'm going to read you the review I wrote of it when I first finished reading it. This book has it all. The Committee to Investigate Intestinal Affairs. That is the original CIA. The Lifeguards, the original Secret Service. The first known instance of biological warfare in the United States when they were not even the United States yet. They were still the colonies. The British, during the Revolutionary War, sent smallpox-infected people into Washington's camps to try to wipe out his forces. And, of course, treason. You've all heard of Benedict Arnold, but how many of you have heard of the lifeguard? Not those that sit at the beach, but the original Secret Service folks. This book is based on historical texts, so there are some unknowns. I am amazed at the success of those early rebels, given the overwhelming odds they faced. They were outmanned, most of them had little to no training, and the king's army was top-notch at the time. They faced devastating weather, illness, and hardships that would make most of us throw up our hands in despair. But they persisted. And for those of you that were wondering, that's what we actually celebrate on the 4th of July, not just barbecues. Washington was a deeply moral, amazingly intelligent, committed man who truly was, from what I read here, a linchpin in the war's success. I often found myself wondering how I would respond under many of the circumstances they faced and saddened by the thought that such courage, integrity, and true heroism is not apparent in our world today. And then I just said I would recommend this book to action, strategy, and history lovers. So here we go. I'm actually going to read the prologue and the prelude and chapter one, but they're very short. It's only 11 pages total. And here we go with The First Conspiracy by Brad Metzler and Josh Mensch. Prologue. New York, New York, April 1776. The trap is set. It's quiet on this night, and moonlight shines over a clearing in the dense woods. The silence is broken only by the drumbeat of hooves in the distance, but it is growing steadily louder. Soon, several uniformed men on horseback emerge from the blackness. The party halts not far from a large wooden manor house that sits at the clearing's edge. A few of the riders dismount and prime their muskets, standing guard. They scan the clearing, apparently deeming it safe. They are wrong. A moment later, another rider steps from his horse. He's taller than the rest and wears a long officer's coat. He is George Washington, the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. There is a traitorous plot against him, and he has no idea it's coming. For the last 10 months, since the day he was appointed to his command, 
Washington has had a nearly impossible task to organize a scattered mess of backwoods militia and untrained volunteers into a functioning national army. Not just any army, this small, inexperienced, poorly equipped group of soldiers needs to stand up to what is probably the biggest and most powerful military force in the world. By any normal measure, they do not stand a chance. And Washington knows this, just as he knows that with every decision he makes, thousands of young soldiers' lives could be lost. Tonight, even more is at risk. Washington has just arrived in the western woods of Manhattan, about two miles north of New York City's bustling commercial district, which covers the island's entire southern tip. What he's facing is terrifying. Sometimes in the next few weeks or months, a massive fleet of the vaunted British Navy will swarm into New York Harbor. Hundreds of ships and tens of thousands of soldiers prepared to invade the city. They're coming. It's just a question of when. The colonies have placed all of their hopes in him. It is up to this one man, George Washington, to lead the small continental army and withstand this massive attack. Tonight, among the soldiers accompanying Washington are a few dressed a little differently from the rest. In short blue and white coats with brass buttons, they are known as the lifeguards, an elite group of specially trained, hand-picked soldiers serving as Washington's bodyguards. He takes particular pride in these men whom he trusts above all others. In the faint moonlight, Washington walks slowly towards the nearby manor house that will serve as his lodging for the next few critical weeks before the British attack. Yet, what Washington doesn't know is that Right here in Manhattan, the coming battle is not the only thing he should fear. At this exact moment, three miles away, due southeast in New York Harbor, a ship is anchored in the darkness. On board is one of the most powerful men in the colonies, the exiled governor of New York, and he is masterminding a clandestine plan to sabotage the colony's rebellion. In the dead of night, small boats carrying spies shuttle back and forth to him, delivering intelligence from home. At the same time, two miles away from where Washington now stands, the mayor of New York City, working in concert with the governor, carries a secret cache of money. His plan is to tempt Washington's soldiers to betray their army and their countrymen in a breathtaking act of treason. And most of you have probably heard of Benedict Arnold, who did commit treason, but not here in this particular situation. Several blocks from the mayor's office, in one of the city's underground jails, three prisoners whisper to each other in a dank cell, out of earshot of the guards. They have no idea that their quiet murmurs could change the future of a continent. These are all players in an extraordinary plot, a deadly plot against George Washington. Most extraordinary of all, some of the key members of this plot 
are in Washington's own inner circle, the very men in whom he has placed his greatest trust. You could call it the United States' first great conspiracy, but at the moment, the United States doesn't even exist yet. Some of the details of this scheme are still shrouded in mystery, but history provides enough clues for an astonishing story. This is a story of soldiers, spies, traitors, redcoats, turncoats, criminals, prostitutes, politicians, great men, terrible men, and before it's over, the largest public execution that has ever taken place on North American shores. It all happens amazingly within days of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In many ways, the plot against Washington would lead to a creation of a whole new field of American spycraft, now known as counterintelligence. At its center is a deadly conspiracy against the one man on whom the very future of America rests. Which takes us to the prelude. Fredericksburg, Virginia, July 1752. So we're now going back a few years. It is a hot summer's day in Virginia, and this young man is full of sorrow. He's barely 20 years old and with no college education. He's a terrible speller, but he's better at math. He grew up mostly in a rural farming region in King George County, across the Rappahannock River from Fredericksburg. His name is George Washington. And today, his world has been shattered. He just found out his older half-brother, Lawrence, has died. For several years, Lawrence had been suffering from tuberculosis, which had been sweeping through the southern colonies. Doctors had warned that the illness could be fatal, and lately, Lawrence had been bedridden by coughs and fever. Still, Lawrence had always been strong, handsome, 34 years old, and in his prime. The family couldn't believe that Lawrence would succumb to the disease. Certainly, George could have. Nine years earlier, when George was 11, their father, Augustine, had died unexpectedly, leaving his family in both grief and financial turmoil. George's mother was left to raise five young children on her own and run their estate without an income. After this tragedy, it was Lawrence, then a dashing young man in his mid-twenties, who swept in and took George under his wing. Born to a different mother, Lawrence had grown up in relative privilege. He traveled to London for his college education and soon served as an officer within the provincial forces under the British Navy. After his return to Virginia, he had married into a wealthy and powerful family and become a leader in local affairs. Fortune had smiled on Lawrence. He was worldly, ambitious, and sophisticated. Young George, a country boy, was none of these things. But Lawrence took a great interest in this younger brother whom their father had left behind. The two were often inseparable. Lawrence was many things to George, a role model, a hero, and a surrogate father. When Lawrence was hit by tuberculosis, it was George who sat by his bedside. Now, Lawrence is gone too, and for the second time in his life, young George has been left alone. When the final estate papers are read, it is revealed that Lawrence had set aside two parcels of land for George. 
There's also the possibility that he might one day inherit Lawrence's own beloved estate, Mount Vernon. I've actually been there. It is truly beautiful. And Washington himself pioneered some very unique methods of farming that made it a very prolific estate. Um, so if you ever get the chance, definitely go by and see it. But for George, now 20 years old, gaining a few parcels of land did not begin to fill the void left by the loss of his brother. This was arguably the most important man in young George's life. Reflecting on his older brother's varied accomplishments, perhaps what George most admired is Lawrence's past glory as a military officer. Fulfillment of a greater duty, dedication to a larger cause, these ideals had transformed his brother's life and provided him with a grand purpose. Now, with Lawrence gone, George is searching for a purpose of his own. A month earlier, in June 1752, while Lawrence lay on his deathbed, George wrote a letter to the Lieutenant Governor of the Colony of Virginia. His goal was to apply for a position in the local militia run by the colony's royal government. It is a position formally held by Lawrence, a position that would now be vacant. George had no military experience or skills to speak of so all his letter offered was an earnest promise to do his best to honor his brother's work. Quote, I should take the greatest pleasure in punctually obeying your honor's commands and by strict observance of my duty, render myself worthy of the trust reposed in me. Perhaps because of the letter's sincerity, or because of Lawrence's reputation, or perhaps just due to good timing, George received the position. Within weeks after the death of his boyhood hero, he prepares to wear a uniform for the very first time. Maybe as a soldier, he too will find his deeper purpose. This young man from Virginia George Washington is now on a road to fulfill a destiny greater than he could ever imagine. And nothing, not even the fear of death itself, is going to stop him. Which brings us to chapter one of First Chapter Friday. 23 years later, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, May 10th, 1975. Philadelphia feels alive. For the past few days, the most prominent leaders in the colonies have been arriving in the city. Coaches and carriages are pulling in almost by the hour, often met by cheering crowds and marching bands. Onlookers fill the streets and watch from porches and windows. The inns are full to capacity and the taverns are bustling. The mood is mostly festive, but the air is also charged with something else. The unique mix of anticipation and fear that comes with the feeling that the world is about to change, though no one knows exactly how. The occasion is momentous, a meeting of the Second Continental Congress. Delegates chosen from every colony are meeting here for one purpose, to debate the possibility of war with England. Just one year earlier, such a notion was unthinkable, except to the most radical. But in recent months, long-standing disputes have grown and multiplied between the crown and its colonial subjects across the ocean. Arguments over trades and taxes and tariffs have turned into deep grievances. On the colonist side, rallies and protests against the crown's repressive policies have grown louder, 
larger, and angrier. England has responded by sending soldiers to clamp down on protest and reassert the mother country's absolute power. In the New England colonies, local rebel militias have been preparing to stand up to royal authorities. Earlier in the year, King George III declared the colony of Massachusetts to be in a state of rebellion against England. And recently, outside Boston, blood has been spilled. On the evening of April 18th, a regiment of British soldiers stationed in the city marched overnight toward the neighboring towns of Lexington and Concord to arrest two rebel leaders and seize a cache of munitions that the colonial militias were stockpiling. The colonists learned of the plan in advance, and when the British arrived in Lexington, a band of armed locals were there to meet them. In the melee that followed, the British forces killed eight townspeople and lost only a horse. When the British troops advanced towards Concord, however, they encountered a much larger colonial militia. No one knows which side began firing first, but whoever pulled that first trigger fired the shot heard around the world. And if you go to Lexington and Concord, now you can actually see where the battlefield where all of this started. Both the British and the colonists suffered heavy casualties in this sustained fighting. Within 48 hours, the British soldiers were driven back into Boston and royal authorities put the city under lockdown. The bloodshed sent shockwaves throughout the colonies, especially in New England. The future is uncertain. Was this violence a local Boston skirmish or the start of a larger war? And of course, we now know it was the start of the Revolutionary War. Is peaceful reconciliation still possible? Or is it time for the colonies to mobilize and raise arms? What an exciting, terrifying time. These are the urgent questions the Second Continental Congress has convened to answer. But from England's perspective, the very meeting of this so-called Congress is an act of rebellion. England does not recognize the Congress as legitimate. England never authorized any such gathering of delegates from the round the colonies, and, in fact, forbade it. From the point of view of the British Parliament and the Crown, this Congress has no authority, wields no power, and represents nothing. And yet, here they are. They have come from Rhode Island, New Jersey, Connecticut, and the far off northern lands of New Hampshire. They've come from Delaware, Maryland, and even from the southern swamps of South Carolina. There are 65 delegates in all, representing 12 of the 13 colonies. Only one colony, Georgia, has declined to participate though soon it too will send a representative. Just the logistical effort of organizing all these delegates to meet at one time and place is a major accomplishment. With the transportation technology of the day, horses, the trip for some delegates from their home cities may take as long as two weeks, not including delays for weather or getting lost. That means eight hours of travel per day on coach seats or saddles over bumpy roads with bathroom breaks often taking place in swamps or brush by the side of the road. The invitations themselves were handwritten letters delivered on horseback with long delays. The delegates had to commit to leaving behind businesses, families, and local fairs for what they thought new might be a period of many months. Adding hydrometer to the proceedings, two of the delegates from Massachusetts 
Sam Adams, and John Hancock had to hide out in fields and farmhouses during the first part of their journey for fear of British soldiers who had been sent to detain them because of their roles in organizing the Boston Revolt. They secretly met up en route with the other Massachusetts delegates, including Sam Adams' cousin, John Adams. Then they escaped across the colony lines to merge with the Connecticut delegation for the trip to Pennsylvania. Word quickly spread of this dramatic journey, and by the time the group arrived in Philadelphia, they were greeted as heroes. Escorted by a band of militiamen and cheered on by crowds as they passed. Some of the delegates sensed a consequence even larger than the immediate fate of the colonies. A new idea had slowly been forming, borrowed from philosophers in Europe, and filtered through the specific experience of the American colonists. At the heart of it lies a fundamental question. Is it natural and just for people to be ruled by the absolute power of a monarch who claims divine authority? Or, in fact, do people have a right, an inherent right, to choose their own government and rule themselves? Think about that question for a minute. The fundamental question, is it natural and just for people to be ruled by the absolute power of a monarch claiming divine authority? Or, in fact, do people have a right, an inherent right, which language is in our Constitution, to choose their own government and therefore rule themselves? Such a simple idea today. Back then, this was a radical concept and a dangerous one. In pamphlets, a new world is being thrown around, liberty. And this word represents an incredible threat. It is not just a challenge to the powerful royal family in England. It is a challenge to centuries of vested power and authority everywhere. As Thomas Paine will soon write, we have it in our power to begin the world all over again. It is an exhilarating but terrifying time because in order to exercise that power, the fragile colonist must raise arms against one of the greatest military powers history has ever known. The air is alive in Philadelphia, and the world is about to change. And that is the start, the first conspiracy, the secret plot to kill George Washington.